Welcome to an, another episode of the Heat Check. Um, I'm Anthony Chang, Miami Herald's Miami Heat beat writer. Um, David Wilson is not here this week. Um, he'll be back next week. But we do have Barry Jackson, um, the Buzz. How are you, Barry? Hi, Anthony. Good to be with you again. Apparently, I only come in either during the playoffs or during uh, an unmitigated debacle. During the first uh, seven-game losing streak in uh, almost 17 years, 18 years, right? Oh, my goodness. It's been tough to watch. A tough 10 days. Yeah, it's been it's been something. Um, I guess to start, the buzzwords over the last 24 hours have been effort, disposition, uh, doing tough things. It, it seems like the message after the Heat's latest loss, which was a 118-105 loss to the Suns, on Monday, their third straight loss by double digits, their fifth double-digit loss in the, in the seven-game losing streak. Um, it seems like the message is it's more about effort than X and O's, more, more about effort than schematics. Do you think it's that simple? I don't. I do think that what's been most appalling has been the effort things, the open dunks that we saw against the Knicks and again last night against the, or on Monday night against the Suns. That is in part effort. It's part of lackadaisical play, lack of attention to detail. So I think some of the open dunks and defensive breakdowns can be fixed from an effort and attention to detail standpoint. But I think the broader problems are a byproduct of talent issues. And I say that because we're not sure at this point how many plus defenders are there left on the Heat's roster. Uh, we know that from an offensive standpoint, they have enough talent to be a playoff team, but they don't have the type of firepower that a handful of other teams have, Boston, Milwaukee, Philadelphia to an extent, uh, certainly some of the teams in the West with Denver, the Clippers, Minnesota. So to me, their pathway to success is very narrow, and they were able to navigate that pathway effectively the last four years, and the, the formula for that pathway was – maniacal, elite at times, mm -hmm. high energy defense combined with what's known, of course, as playoff Jimmy and timely performances from role players, whether it was Caleb Martin, the Eastern finals, whether it was Gabe Vincent against Milwaukee in the first round, whether it was Max Struess to save their behind in the play in game against Chicago. So that was the combination that was needed to get past rosters that were probably better, in my view, with Milwaukee and Boston last year. And if they don't have that exact formula, the question becomes, is the roster too limited to have sustained success or to even be better than a sixth, seventh, or eighth seed in the East? It all starts to me with that defensive zeal and the ability physically to be able to defend beyond the effort. Uh, to you, Anthony, is it, Partly talent, partly effort, or do you does it tilt more toward lack of talent on the roster at this point? Uh, I think all of the above, honestly, and I know it's a cop out answer, but I to your point, I think if this team doesn't have that effort, that you know the, the quote unquote heat culture, those hustle plays, they can't out talent most teams. They don't have a Kevin Durant. They don't have you know. Uh, a Giannis, right? They don't have a Jason Tatum. Things are hard for the Heat. Even when they win games, they grind out games. Jimmy Butler goes to the foul line 15 times. You know, like they have to hold teams under, you know, to uh you have to have play elite defense, like you said. It's take charges, you know, force turnovers. Like they have to win the margins. They're not going out, they don't have a guy who just wake up and score 40 points. Um, so I think the effort has to be there. And if it's not there then really they don't have a shot against probably 20 of the 30 teams in the NBA, I would say. Yeah. You know? And so get into the question of, and obviously we'll have months to figure this out. Yeah. We doubt there's going to be seismic changes before the trade deadline. That's not how the heat operates. They've been supremely patient over the last few years. And then the question is how ultimately do you fix it? If you determine uh, that this roster just isn't going places uh, I want people on MiamiHerald.com to check out our four-part series where we explain a lot of these issues that have befallen the Heat and where the franchise goes from here. But I want to talk about the two pieces that we wrote as part of that series on Tuesday. 
Uh, I want to get into yours. You had some fascinating quotes from Hero and Bam. To start with mine, uh, where we delved into the issue of the Heat's big three, why are they not better as a group? And I went back and looked at the numbers the past four years. What's interesting to me is during the bubble run, of course, they had Goran Dragic, Jay Crowder, mm-hmm. and other really good pieces alongside. The Heat's big three, which is what Spolstra calls them, played exceptionally well when they were on the court together in the bubble. They played exceptionally well in the 2002 playoff run when Hero was limited by an injury in the Eastern Conference Finals. But during those two runs, the big three, when they were on the court at the same time, produced offensive numbers and plus minuses that would be ideal for any team's top three scores. So why magically was that loss? And I know a lot of people will say, well, all of this coincides with Hero becoming a starter. But to me, that's not the root of the issue, because whether Hero is starting or not, he's still going to play a lot with Bam and with Butler, because you need a $27, $29 million a year player when you're most skilled offensive player playing with your other two best players. So why has it suddenly diminished so the quality of those three together? Uh, your theories would be what? Well, I think Jimmy hasn't been as good this regular season, number one. He was elite, a top 10 player during those runs. Um, I would argue during the bubble run, that actually the big three was probably Goran, Bam, and Jimmy, right, at that point. Tyler was a rookie, played very well, but he wasn't, probably Goran still was the, the leading guy at that point. And I think things aren't this, even though they're in their fifth season as teammates, things change, dynamics change. Games grow, supporting cast change, players decline, players improve. Jimmy's uh, operating right now this season at a usage rate that would be his lowest in a Heat uniform. Bam Adebayo has a career high usage rate. Tally Hero, second highest uh, usage rate of his career. Jimmy's not as involved as he was the past three seasons. Whether that's him taking a back seat and wanting to pace himself, or whether that's him you know, maybe taking a little step back from the gym we've seen the last few years. We don't know until the playoffs, right, if they get there. Um, I think that's part of it. I think Tyler back then was, um, again, he was a rookie. He wasn't a guy that you depended on to have a, again, 27, 28. Tyler Hero has the highest usage rate on the team right now. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I know a lot of fans would say it's a bad thing. Um, but there's numbers that you could point to and say that's not a bad thing. I think they're, I put in my piece today, they're like 10 and 1 when his usage rate is over 29% and 1 and 9 when his usage rate is under 26%. He need, Tyler Hero needs to be involved. Well, that's just more of the catch and shoot guy or with the ball in his hands that could be debated, but he needs to be a big part of the offense. Um, but I guess my answer to your question would be Jimmy Butler taking a step back. And I think the dynamic has changed a little bit where Bam and Tyler expect to be have a bigger part in the offense. And that has changed some of the way this offense works because now they have to balance their high aspirations with their roles and their fit because their fit isn't as natural. They're all mid-range guys. So they all have to kind of adjust their games to make it work. Tyler, before making the eyebrow raising comment last night about needing to sacrifice by taking more uh, threes as opposed to mid-range shots, He made some interesting comments to you that you had today in a piece on MiamiHerald.com. Can can you get into those? Yeah. um, He basically said he's trying to to figure it out. I'm trying to get the quote right now. Um, And they're trying to, you know, Eric Spolcher has been telling him, him specifically, he said, to take fewer mid-range shots, to be more of a spot-up shooter, to take more catch-and-shoot threes, which makes sense, right? This team needs more three-point attempts. Tyler Hero is one of the best three-point shooters on the team. Um, and But this is what he said when he when I asked him about playing more as a catch-and-shoot guy. He said, I don't feel too comfortable just doing that because that's not me or myself. You spend a lot of time in the summer working out and doing what you're asked to do. And then you try to come back and implement what you've worked on into, into the team. But I'm just trying to figure it out. Um, and he said, I feel like some people think I'm just shooting shots. I feel like when I'm in attack mode and not just playing off the catch is when I'm at my best or our team is at our best. Because when I'm getting into the paint, I feel like I can create a lot of overhelps and guys overreacting to me with the ball in my hands. So we'll see. So it's clear that he's not a huge fan of the way he's being used right now, right? Which I think is evident. He's trying to make it work. His catch and shoot threes are up. His mid-range shots are down over the last few weeks. 
the results haven't been great. He hasn't been shooting a great percentage. Um, his scoring is down. The offense has not looked good. So I get the strategy of trying to make telling Tyler to do that, but the results haven't been good. Will it pick him in the long run? Will it be better? We'll see. Um, but I think that's a big part of what's going on right now. Guys, the team is finally healthy for the first time, what, since last regular season? Because they Tyler didn't play in the playoffs last year, basically. And this is a huge adjustment period. And they're all trying to figure it out. And it's unfortunately coming during a seven-game losing streak, the longest losing streak since 2008. And it just puts more pressure on everything. And it hasn't helped that Bam is going through his worst yeah. offensive slump of the year, missing 40 of his last 46 mid-range shots. So everything is happening at once. Other teams are hitting open threes at a rate far higher than they did earlier this season. They each gone through a miserable three-point stretch where they've gone from top five in the league in three-point percentage to one of the league's worst yeah. three-point shooting That's teams. That's a big part of it. Can I, can I yes. make one point to that? Because some of this is quote-unquote make or miss. It's a make or miss league, and it would help if they make more shots. The Heat are shooting an NBA worst thirty eight percent on open shots during the seven game losing streak. They're generating yeah. the fifth most open shots during that time, so they're they're getting open shots, but they're shooting them at a league worst rate. So again, the process might be it might not be terrible, but they're the shots are just not going in. And Eric Spoelstra has mentioned that that he's not worried about the offense because he thinks eventually those shots will go in. Um, but like I said, eventually, uh, unfortunately, right now. <laughs> everything is going wrong for them at the same time. And we've seen a lot of candor, I think, over the last 36 hours. The hero comments, obviously, about sacrificing and changing his game and what he told you. Also, I thought the Butler comment last night, while very basic, was very true. They can't stop anybody off the dribble. They're constantly allowing yeah. penetrations. This has been a problem, obviously, in the past when Lowry you know, lost his ability to be a plus defender. But they've been even worse at it this year. Caleb Martin today was saying, look, I have to be a better defender. I've defended better than this in the past. I have to be able to defend at a high level again. He was very upset with himself. Even Highsmith, who you could make the case is their best perimeter defender now, with Jimmy regressing a bit defensively, even Highsmith last night was blown by several times. So who exactly on this team now is the elite perimeter defender and that today brought up the issue that was raised to Spolstra by another reporter. Can you continue to start Rozier and Hero together and not be so vulnerable defensively? And Spolstra insisted the answer was yes. And to me, Anthony, I think that's a byproduct partly of simply not having a better option because Josh right. Richardson is not the defender he was three or four years ago. Uh, you're probably not going to start Hawkes at this point of his career as a two guard. So where exactly do you turn? It almost is a necessity to continue starting here on Rozier, even though it's a, you know, below average defensive backcourt, even though they're undersized. I know obviously Tyler is giving effort, but there have been a lot of breakdowns from him and from others these last few games. Rozier is allowing a player he's defending to shoot uh, 49% when he was in Charlotte this year well over 50% in his first few games for the Heat. So I don't know how you fix that if this is your long-term backcourt. I don't think there is a fix with this personnel. I just, uh, I think I was going to ask what your biggest concern is. For me, I'm going to answer that question. It's the defense. Because I don't expect this offense to be elite. I don't even expect it to be above average. If they're average, it's a win. And they're probably in good shape, right? Last year, they got... And they made the playoffs with whatever the 27th, 26th, 26th ranked offensive rating. They're 22nd right now, which is probably kind of in the range. Unfortunately, we probably expected entering the regular season. But the defense, if they don't have a top 10 defense, they have no shot. They really don't. And I think that's kind of what Eric Spolscher is saying, right? They have the 28th ranked defense during this losing streak. They've been one of the worst defensive teams. And I think we've been so used to Eric Spolster just kind of being able to coach his way into a top 10 defense. They've been a top 10 defense for seven of the last eight seasons, whether it's playing zone a record amount of times, he always finds a way, but the personnel to me in almost every lineup you play, you have probably two to three, I don't say bad defenders, but not plus defenders. And that's hard to hide. That's hard to overcome. Bam can only do so much. Like you said, Jimmy, according to advanced metrics, defense has slipped a little bit. Caleb Martin, 
According to advanced metrics, his defense has slipped a little bit. He's admitted as much. Josh Richardson, same thing. Really, Bam and Haywood have been probably the two plus defenders so far on this roster. Um, and right. it's hard and to have a top 10 defense when you only have two plus defenders in your rotation. That's a problem. Exactly. I left out Duncan's name when I talked about other yeah. potential starting shooting guard options. However, obviously, you're still with a defensive deficit with Duncan starting as well, even though his game has obviously improved in so many other areas. So, uh, you know, even if Spolstra wanted to take the risk of moving Hero to the bench, would obviously, which obviously would risk losing him mentally, I'm still not sure it would produce any more right. positive results because who exactly are you going to plug in? Uh, the defensive point you just made, I totally agree with, and I would frame it through this prism. If you do not have a clear-cut all-star and an elite NBA scorer on your roster, like Boston and Milwaukee and the Clippers and Denver and Philadelphia and Oklahoma City, obviously, with Gilgis Alexander and a couple of others, then there is no path to be successful if you don't have a top half of the league defense. And there's probably no path to make any sort of playoff run if you don't have a top 10 defense. So right now they're sitting yeah. at 14 in defensive rating, which as many of our listeners know is points per 100 possessions. Yeah. They're 28th in that category in January, as you just pointed out. So with the amount of talent they have in a league that scoring obviously is at levels that it hasn't been at in decades, there is no path to victory if your defense is playing at the level this defense is right now. Yeah, to me, that's what it comes down to. A, you need to have a top 10 player to be a championship contender, right? And Jimmy has been that for the last few seasons. He hasn't been that this season. Um, and their defense has not been as good this year. I think those two things are probably the two most concerning aspects of not only this losing streak, but this season. I Absolutely. Mean, and as far as fixing it, a lot of people will email us and will say on social media, hey, why don't you trade Hero for a a, a four who has size, a power forward who has size. And that's just not the type of trade that's going to be available. Certainly not a, a high level starting caliber power forward. No team is giving up one of those for a shooting guard who, albeit a good player, is not an all star at this point in his career and might not be. So that's not going to find you the roster's biggest need at this point, which is a defender like an Ananobi who also has the size to mm -hmm. be able to defend fours. And remember, one of the reasons why the Heat has gone small over this four-year run is because Spolstra is more comfortable playing alongside Bam, a player who can space the floor, because Bam has been unable to. He doesn't have a three-point game. So that has, I think, gotten you into this bind. And I don't blame Spolstra for this. It was done out of necessity. But that has gotten to you into this bind where they are perpetually small, it's pointed out by every national TV analyst who comes in here. Reggie Miller was bemoaning last week how tiny the heat looks when the Celtics have Cornette and Horford uh, right. getting uh, balls caroming off the rim and dunking uh, over heat players who are four to five inches shorter. But the question is, how ultimately do you solve that issue of finding more size to insert in your lineup? Because if Jimmy's here and if Bam is here, then the place to insert that size would either be a four or perhaps with another guard if Hero was ultimately yeah. moved. But you need more size playing up front. And how are you going to do that if Spolstra is more comfortable with a four who can defend wings and mm -hmm. who can shoot threes than the old school traditional type four that Pat Riley might have liked? I don't know how that gets reconciled. And I don't know how you find that player you're certainly not going to find a player of that skill for Tyler Hero. That's no disrespect no, to Tyler. Or, just, or on the buyout market either. You're not going to just exactly. not gonna, yeah. Right, right. So I don't know how that ultimately gets solved as far as finding a way to get this team bigger. So yeah. that's that's one concern we have. Yeah, and and that four needs to shoot threes. I mean, any player really in that lineup next to Bam and Jimmy needs needs to be able to space the floor. If not, it's just going to be like we said. It's going to be the same, you know, operating the same area. So you can't have like let's say an Andre Drummond. That's just right. not going to work. Yes, he didn't bring more size, better rebounding, some rim protection, but offensively, that's going to be rough, right? So it's such a unique fit. You know, I I mean, I don't think this fixes all the issues, but do you think about playing Kevin Love with Bam now like more? I mean, does that help? 
I mean, defensively, there are some issues there, but he's smart. He's a veteran. You know, he takes charges. He's bigger. He's a really good rebounder still. He can space the floor on offense. He's a good passer. Do you try to do that? You know, I don't know. On the roster, that's probably really the only way you could go. I, or maybe playing Orlando Robinson with his improved three-point shot. I don't think that's going to happen. But maybe the Kevin Love move. Maybe that's what you do. But yeah, to your point, I don't think there is... This is the mix, right? Whether hero starts or not, this is the mix of guys. And it's not going to change dramatically whether you change the rotation or change the starting lineup or hero plays less with the starters. It's going to be... You have to figure it out with this group. There aren't going to be any more big additions, I don't believe. I really... I mean, I don't know. That's... Trey Dillon's a week away, but they got Terry Rozier. Um, and he's going to help offensively, but it doesn't fix the team's biggest issues, which come down to the big three that they have, the quote-unquote big three, Bam, Jimmy, and Tyler. They need to figure things out, and, and you know, we'll see if they can in the coming weeks. But right now, it's everything is a struggle. And you can't sell low on Hero. I think that would no. be a mistake. He's had five games of fewer than 20 points after having only five games of fewer than 20 in his first 23 games this year. And obviously you're not going to do anything seismic with Butler in the next week. If, if they ever even consider trading Jimmy, which would probably be surprising to both of us, that would be a summer discussion. Uh, so, yes, there's just no way to dramatically improve your roster in the next week. You've already given up a first-round pick for Rozier. You have only – one tradable first round pick at the moment that will become two if you either change protections with Oklahoma City and Charlotte. Also, you can use your first round pick on draft night in June to pick a player for another team. So there is a way they can finagle two first round picks uh, in order to be able to trade. Uh, I would say so we're not totally bleak on this uh, podcast and it feels certainly bleak at the moment. I, I would say let's talk for a couple minutes about the pathway to solve this. Because if you're a glass half full guy, you could say this. If they get back to the high energy, high effort heat, which they talked about today in a very blunt, a brutally blunt film session players talked about on Tuesday. And then if you get the hero of the first couple of weeks of the season before he was injured, if you get more of playoff Jimmy, If you get Bam playing like he did early in the season with a feathery mid-range shot that he was consistently hitting, if you get anything close to the Rozier in Charlotte, if you get the Hawkeyes that we saw before Mm -hmm. the groin injury, and if you get even three-quarters of the Eastern Conference Finals' Caleb Martin, there's my glass half-full view for you. That team could certainly compete with Milwaukee in a 2-7 series, knowing the Bucks' defensive deficiencies, or with Philadelphia in a 3-6 series, knowing the 76ers' lack of playoff success. So you could make the case that if everything falls into place, you still can't entirely rule out winning a playoff series. But that's a lot of things to yeah. have to fall into place. And you also need Jimmy, Josh Richardson, uh, Caleb to defend the way they did in the past, Right. Uh, that has to improve for starters. Yeah, I think um, the pathway to kind of, you know, getting back on the right track is you have Eric Spolster and you have Jimmy Butler. And I remember speaking to Caleb Martin for the end of last regular season about what gives you hope? I mean, you guys are going to be in the play-in tournament. Like, what gives you hope? No team has ever done this. What would make you think you can go all the way to the NBA Finals, which they did? And he goes, we have Jimmy Butler and Jimmy Butler and Eric Spolstra. And the best coach in the NBA, one of the best playoff performers in the NBA. We have faith that we'll figure it out. And in the playoffs, we're better suited for that type of format. Um, And they've proven that the last four years. So at this point, how could we really doubt them? Um, So I would say that's kind of a a reason to be for some hope. Um, And obviously, Jimmy needs to play better. He needs to be more consistent. He needs to be a better defender. He needs to be more aggressive on offense. He needs to finish better around the rim, which he hasn't been doing this year. Um, and then the other thing I would point to is what I talked about earlier. They're missing a lot of open shots. Um, they're generating open shots, a lot of them, which is a good sign, but they're missing a lot of open shots. You would think the law of averages is at, at some point that's going to turn, right? And that will make things look a lot better. Um, so 
that's I guess what I would point to. But again, if they're not a top ten defense, um, it's going to be really tough for them because they don't have the offense to overcome that against quality teams. And that shows. I think they're now seven and sixteen against teams with winning records this season. Something like right. that. They've had. They've really struggled against good teams this year. And also. What's so strange about this year is it's a strange example of a team that falls apart after getting healthy, right? I mean, yeah. how, how how often is that a reality in sports where your team gets healthy, your best players come back, and then you unravel? Uh, I know, obviously, a lot of fans are clamoring for changes. I would point out this, something you and I talked about off air today, which is it's really hard to change your roster when you have a team that's underachieving. Look how hard the Chicago Bulls have tried for three years to try to fix a mix that isn't working. They're sitting there still with Zach Levine and DeRozan and Vucevic, and they can't do anything. Look at the Hawks, big underachievers this year. They've struggled to make any significant move. They still have DeJounte Murray, uh, Murray at the time of this taping. Toronto before this year, they were sort of just waddling along for a couple of years, underachieving. So it's not going to be as simple, even if this season ends with a meek playoff exit or with a play-in loss, even though obviously efforts will be made to change the cast over the summer, it's not as easy as just snapping your fingers. Uh, so it's going to be fascinating to me if the Heat recovers from this and at least exits the season nobly where the front office thinks of, we've got to do something. Maybe we move Tyler. Maybe we do moves around the edges or whether this season ends in such a train wreck that it would open their minds to considering anything. And I know we both agree the trading BAM is the most unlikely of scenarios, but there, I mean, there, there certainly is a scenario where if they lose to the Kings, if they lose, God forbid at Washington on Friday, if they lose to Orlando or San Antonio next week, not that we're expecting any seismic changes before yeah. next Thursday's trade deadline, but there is a, a case to be made where if this season totally goes off the rails and ends absolutely on the disaster course that we're on now, that you could make the case for them to consider anything and everything this summer. That, to me, is the most fascinating thing that's going to play out over these next few months. Yeah, I think. And even, you know, again, like I don't think you, you and I don't really expect a huge move before Thursday, right, before the deadline. But what if they do lose out the rest of the way until Thursday? What if they are an 11 game? I don't think that's going to happen. But what if they are an 11 game losing streak entering, entering the deadline? Do, I mean, are they forced to do something at that point? Like, will they just let the deadline pass without doing anything? So it is going to be an interesting few days. I mean, this is I've been on the beat for eight years. It's made a season. And obviously, I haven't seen a seven-game losing streak. This is the first one since 2008. But I just don't remember. I don't remember players and Eric Spolstra this raw, this vulnerable. And Eric Spolstra just kind of, you know, to his credit, like letting his guard down. And, you know, yesterday he was asked about using zone. I'm searching. Like, I'll, anything that works, I don't know at this point. Like, he just doesn't know where to turn to it. You know, and that's, you know, he's a... He, the best coach in the NBA, according to GMs. Um, so that says a lot right there. So I think these are, there's a really interesting time for the heat and we're going to learn a lot, not only in the next yeah. week, but in the coming weeks for the rest of the season. It's incredible because they've gotten away with four years and really have an impressive body of work over those four years, even though it's lacking a championship, but they've gotten away with four years of not having the elitist of talent and certainly yeah. not a top a quarter of the league offensive talent. And not only have they gotten away with it, they've thrived with it, making three long playoff runs in four years going to NBA finals. But it's like, as I joked on Twitter last night with uh, with Clay Ferraro from uh, Channel 10 locally, it's like they've hit the four and a half year wall, right? Instead of the rookie wall, they've hit the four yeah. and a half year wall where maybe they've had enough of each other. It's just not working anymore. They've regressed defensively. Age has taken a toll on some of their older players and it just stopped working. And the question is, does it resume working even at, at all? Right. So it's it's fascinating to watch. It's something we're unaccustomed to witnessing here, having not seen a losing streak of this length, seven games at the time of taping since that 2008 season when they went 15 and 67. So it's it's shocking. It's like seeing a car accident on the side of the road. You can't take your eyes off it just because it's incredible to witness this franchise, not only the seven game losing streak, but the average margin of defeat, Anthony, 
16 points per oh, game yeah, been... during the streak makes it even more astounding. Yeah, the, exactly. Five of the seven losses by double digits. It's just this is not something we're used to. This is not something Heat fans are used to. Um, but yeah, we'll see what they do now. As they as they say, you know, they hope to get to the other side because they don't know what's on the other side, right? right. Um, and we're gonna see when they get there. Uh, you know, the Sacramento game. That's another really good team, another winning team, which they haven't had success against. They have the Wizards on Friday, but then they come home and face the Clip. Like so, schedule is not going to rest till the All Star break. The schedule is hard. Yes, um, it's going to be a very very tough week, two weeks before the All Star break. And it might even be tough for them to get there above 500, right? Even if they, you know, they're not going to lose out, I don't think, but it's going to, they're going to be tested. Um, we're really going to find out uh, more about this team very soon here, next couple of weeks. But because the bottom of the Eastern Conference remains so weak, they're probably yeah. safe for at least the play in. It might be surprising right. if they fall below 10. Uh, but there's obviously a decent chance at this point of seven or eight. New York, obviously, they've lost Julius Randle. But they're well above 500, six games ahead of the Heat. Cleveland is 12 over 500. Yeah. So four and five almost seem out of reach. The question then becomes six. Uh, could you possibly make a move to get to six, depending on how Indiana plays? Yeah. Obviously, the Pacers uh, w- would be the, the favorites at this point for the sixth seed, based on how they're playing, the acquisition of Siakam and how the Heat's playing. So six is certainly realistic, but at this point, you're looking at a 7-8 potential playoff matchup with Orlando, or if Atlanta gets hot or one of the other teams that struggled, maybe you fall in the 9-10 game as a worst-case scenario. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Anything else you want to cover? Were we uh, bleak enough? No, I think <laughs> I think we're good. We'll just see if uh, hopefully they'll snap out of this. I think yeah. in a worst-case scenario, if you lose to the Kings as explosive as they are, and then you get off to a bad start in Washington. If the Wizards just start hitting threes, Jordan Poole and Ariza, and you're down 18 there, then if you think it's bad now, oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Next week one, might be an one interesting can only episode. think how yeah, bad next, it would be then. Just last week, David and I went over the Rozier trade and how much he was going to help and this and that. And here we are a week later talking about a seven game losing streak. So we'll see. And the sky next, is falling. Yes. Yeah, so we'll see what next week brings. Um, if you're not already, which I'm sure most of you are, follow Barry Jackson at FLA Sports Buzz and follow me at Anthony underscore Chang. Check out all of our work at MiamiHerald.com. Um, like Barry said, we have a four-part series on just everything happening with the Heat right now. Their leading trio, the losing streak, what's going on. So we have you covered on there. All right, until next week. Have a good one, everybody.